Last time, we followed the cutthroat trout up Yellowstone River. In this conclusion of our story, we look at the wild mammals and birds whose lives depend on this vital fish. Grazing on grass and digging for grubs, insects, and small animals keeps a grizzly bear busy most of the summer. But for a few weeks, the bears find an easy feast here at Grizzly Creek when the trout spawn. Once again, we've traveled south down the lake. We're following the trout up their spawning streams on the west shore. After that, we'll head back to the southeast arm to film the white pelican colony on the Mali Islands. We're not the only ones interested in cutthroat. A grizzly knows good eating when he catches it, and an egg-laden trout is a double treat. The bear leaves when it hears me coming. From the sounds of things, it won't be back for a while. I'm not about to come between a grizzly and its meal. Surprisingly enough, surviving in bear country can be done by making a little noise. Bear scare over, it's back to trout. The cutthroat spawn wherever the gravel is one to three inches deep and the water temperature 40 to 60 degrees. Because of the varying aquatic conditions in the park, spawning activity may begin as early as May and end as late as August. If the trout here are ready, we'll be able to film the high point of their existence, the actual mating of male and female. First, the larger males, the fish on the right and the one that just swam in, compete for a female. Although the female will also compete with other females for a red or nest site, to lay her eggs, it looks as if this one, now on the left, has already found a perfect place. All she needs is the proper partner. Competition between the males will continue, often up to the very moment of egg laying. The larger, more brilliant male edges out his opponent.
Although that bear didn't care what I looked like, these spawning trout may be more sensitive. Camouflage is called for. I carefully approach the small pool they've chosen. There's a whole new world underwater in this shallow pool. I watch the trout pair perform their pre-spawning rites. It's taken the females four to five years and the males three to four years to reach maturity. It's interesting that the trout's breathing rate differs with the varying amount of oxygen in the water. In the bubbling, oxygen-rich river, they breathe very little. In the lake, it's at a medium rate. And in this shallow, oxygen-poor headwater stream, their breathing rate increases to a very rapid level. At the climax of mating comes the shudder. Sperm and eggs are released simultaneously. The average female releases a thousand eggs. About one-fourth of them survive to hatch a month later. By the end of summer, only five tiny trout, one to two inches long, will remain and re-enter the lake. As for the adults, 15% of them will die due to the rigors of spawning, but they will have left behind their legacy.
You know what? Let me tell you something else. In this lake, in many other areas, the bald eagles eat a lot of fish. In this lake, they have specialized away from eating fish because the osprey is such a good fisherman. I'll be. And something like 95% of the osprey's diet is fish. But listen to this. The ospreys only eat immature trout. And the white pelicans, which are the main predator on trout in the lake, only eat mature fish. So even the ospreys and the pelicans, which both eat cutthroat trout, they don't even compete. They're, they eat different sizes. Different sizes of fish. Isn't that something? It's fascinating. It's incredible. So that's what we're going to show on film. It's going to be great. You know, there's... <laughs> remember Grizzly Bob? That time when that bear sat on his head? Sat on this his guy. head. <laughs> this guy. First assignment was to blow up a car. The next morning, we're off to the islands in the center of the lake to find the water birds that feed on trout. The white pelicans arrive in early spring when ice and snow still cover some of the park, and never far behind them, the California gulls. Most people think of seagulls as living by the sea, but the California gull only winters along the Pacific coast. In summer, most of them fly to Yellowstone and other inland lakes to nest. Lacking the pelican's large pouch and overall size, the gull must make its way by scavenging, following human and wild fishermen for its meals. Half of its diet is cutthroat. Dead ones are fiercely defended from the other gulls. These birds leave the Pacific coast for Yellowstone every spring because of the unequaled number of cutthroat trout in the park. This is the prime reason that the California gull can nest and raise their young here. Even with all the available trout, though, an otherwise proud pelican is not above scavenging from the scavengers themselves. Pelican's logic seems to be, why bother to fish? My trout dinner is already waiting for me on the table. The bird's huge pouch holds about three gallons, the byproduct of scooping up a fish in the water. 
and the pouch is two to three times larger than its stomach. Still, a pelican never carries prey in its big skin flap, but rather in its gullet or esophagus. So the fish must be transferred there first. That was only one pelican. To see the entire colony, we have to go farther down, almost to the end of the southeast arm of the lake. Our motorized boat must stop at a certain point. After that, we row in. The no motor rule around the Mali Islands protects the pelican rookery from human disturbance. This colony of white pelicans is the last in Wyoming, the only one within the boundaries of a national park, and one of only about 15 now remaining throughout the world. Four kinds of water birds nest on the Mali Islands. The pelican alone was persecuted. In the early 1900s, the great birds were blamed for depleting the trout. Nobody took into account the 187 million trout eggs that were removed from the lake by the Bureau of Fisheries for stocking elsewhere. The second strike against the pelican was its role as primary host to a tapeworm that infests the trout. Pelican eggs were destroyed and their babies killed. Today, trout eggs are no longer removed and the tapeworm is known not to be a serious threat. Pelicans are more appreciated, thus the no motor rule. The presence of adult cutthroat trout the pelican's main prey has allowed this colony to survive. We also do our part by moving on. In Yellowstone, unlike other places, the bald eagle prefers birds over fish, waterfowl or its main diet. Although it has a place in the ecology of the cutthroat, the eagle does not play a major role. The osprey does, and it's our next subject. We've learned that a major feeding area for the osprey is around Frank Island, and that's exactly where we're going, back north to the middle of the lake. An osprey pair mates for life, often returning to the same nest year after year. We spot a nest. Unfortunately, the ospreys in the park are not holding their own like the bald eagles. Osprey population decline may be due to human disturbance or to pesticide residues, which can cause their eggs to be brittle. Whatever the reason, we move toward the island very carefully. The osprey is first and foremost a fish eater, earning it the nickname of fish hawk. Its preferred prey in Yellowstone is immature cutthroat trout.
with legendary hawk eyes, it sights a trout from high above the water. But only one out of a number of dives results in a catch. The larger female repairs the nest while the male tries again. We're filming at 300 frames a second. This action is slowed down 12 times. Watch the osprey's plunge dive. It folds its wings and extends its feet just before hitting the water surface. The bird bounces back to the surface, then using its tail as a rudder, rises wet and heavy into the air again. Although the greatest percentage of the osprey's prey are smaller, immature fish, this large cutthroat is adult size. Perhaps growing families require larger fish. The male has taken a moment in mid-flight to arrange the trout head first, thereby reducing its resistance to air. Our dawn to dusk observation over the course of several days showed that these ospreys average one fish per family per day. This one is finally caught after five to ten dives. The amazing cutthroat, the only trout native to the region, supports a wealth of wild creatures.
Osprey nestlings get a good start in life on a rich trout diet. But childhood is brief in these northern mountains, and by mid-September, the Osprey family will fly to South America for the winter. We also must be going, but we're not ready to leave. Our time here went by much too quickly. Our return to the marina means the end of a summer romance with this first lady of our national parks. Soon, winter will grip the land in its icy embrace once again. And then, these wonders that we've come to love will be only bittersweet memories to savor forever. Yellowstone Park is a place of superlatives. The first, the wildest, the biggest, and in my opinion, the best. Born of volcanic fire and chiseled by glacial ice, the park has survived, along with the cutthroat trout. The Park Service will always be faced with the dual task of trying to preserve natural ecosystems while also providing for the pleasure of visitors. But with size and catch limits that work, and no future introductions of non-native species, this fascinating fish will thrive, the cutthroat. I'm Marty Stauffer. Until next time, enjoy our wild America.